Um, the rangers did a great job of getting to Howe Valley Ranch quickly and, and getting people out of harm's way before um, any harm could come to people visiting the park. Um, and subsequent to that, it's all been about fire management um, at, at Heil Valley. And it's a, it's a fire that has touched um, the majority of the property. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share uh, my screen and bring up a, a very impromptu slideshow. So hopefully you can all see that. This is, um, this is a map from yesterday. I don't know what day I want today. Um, so this shows the extent of the um, Calwood fire. I think you can see my cursor. Um, and you can also see um, what's going on with the small left hand fire, which fortunately got started the day after the Calwood, but really has um, not been able to get um, going to the same sort of size and extent as, as Calwood um, for a variety of reasons. Um, but this is it. So you, you can see uh, Lions here. You can see Highway 36 here. You can see um, where left hand um, comes in. So uh, it's extensive and it started up at Cowwood, obviously, and very rapidly um, blew to the east. And I, um, I think I got the first indication that we had a fire shortly after noon, heading closer to one. Um, and then I think by four o'clock, I understood that we were already at 4,000 acres. So it, it moved incredibly rapidly. Um, and to have an appreciation of the, the land ownership that it's affecting, um, this is a pretty accurate map. All the dark green um, is the land that we own in fee title. Um, the uh, sort of lime green are things that we have easements on. Um, this is National Forest Service. Uh, and the white is, is private or state land board or, or other, I think, on this, on this map. So you can see that a good half of the fire um, has consumed or affected um, parks and open space property, which is really significant. Um, and um, I, I'm not sure exactly what the timeline on this one is, but it shows acreage. So it shows the perimeter um, and then the approximate acre by ownership. And at the time that this was taken, um, the perimeter encompassed 10,000 acres and about 4,400 of that was us. Um, so it's obviously a very significant impact to um, parks and open space properties. Um, so what I wanted to show you, um, and then I'm going to um, ask Stefan to step in and kind of round things out, but um, I wanted to show you what I saw um, on Sunday, and some of these pictures were taken by Bevan Carithers, our, our um, lead ranger, and some of them were taken by me, and I've, I've tried to put them in a, a little bit of an organized pattern. Um, so as you, enter, um, as you enter Gear Canyon and head towards the main trailhead at Heil, obviously the first thing that you run into that you'd recognize is the new Corral Trailhood, which has that lovely restored caboose, which was one of the first thoughts I had in my mind about the sorts of infrastructure that we might lose. Um, and uh, so that entire um, Corral area was not impacted by the fire. Um, there's another shot here that shows the western edge where the, the fire burned down from the Overland burn is kind of behind this smoke and fog, um, but burned down through the trees and petered out um, here just beyond our fence line. And the reason for that was largely extremely fortunate and well-placed um, slurry bomber runs, which um, prevented the fire from moving further south and getting into Left Hand Canyon itself. Um, it did cross obviously from, e uh, sorry, from west to east and it crossed over Gear Canyon, but the slurry bombers um, painted a stripe down the southern part of the Overland Burn and crossed right by the northern edge, I think, of our, um, all of that work at the Corral Trailhead and then went up the other side, um, up the ridge line. And it's pretty obvious in places, everything is burned to the north of those lines. And we're fortunate um, that 
this infrastructure was behind the line and that it was able to contain the fire. So everything at the Corral Trailhead um, and including um, just further south, um, the, the school, the Altona Schoolhouse, all of that is safe and sound. And then if you proceed towards the main trailhead, I think most of you know, you sort of go, you, there's a little fork in the road and you turn right and you go over the bridge and into the parking lot. If you actually go left and you go up the hill, you hit a gate. And beyond that gate is um, a private residence as well as um, Kevin Grady, our Rangers um, caretaker residence as well as this um, cabin, I think this is the gear cabin, which was worked on just a few years ago by um, Boulder County Youth Corps, who did a lot of restoration. And um, it was, uh, fire went all the way around this cabin and burned everything around it. Fortunately, did not um, combust this tree. And that's why this cabin is still perfectly intact and standing. Um, this is the, the, the caretaker's cabin perfectly intact and standing. Um, and as I understand it, part of that's probably due to our ranger who's done a great job with defensible space up there and, and continues to keep the grass really low. So the fire petered out here. And the thing that I thought for sure would be gone is this historic barn because um, I kind of, I like to say that it just looks like if you looked at that barn wrong, it would probably go up in flame um, because it's just such a, old, weathered, wonderful, historic barn. Um, but the fire is all along the back and along the side. But one thing that um, certainly helps is it has um, a pronounced stone, sort of a raised stone foundation that goes all the way around. And you can see there's even stone on the backside. So because of some defensible space measures, because of some of the fortunate construction methods that were used and probably just good luck itself, um, that whole complex is fine. And if you go further up the road here, um, you go up to the private residence that's back there. And I included these just because I thought this was this was great. And I understand from Vivian, you'll be able to read about this draft horse and this this donkey in the paper soon. Um, the the family that lives here um, were unable to load up the horses and so they had to evacuate um, and leave the horses behind. And when the firefighters finally got in, um, they were greeted by these two horses who were probably really glad uh, to see somebody friendly. Um, and this next picture just shows you how big a draft horse um, that guy is. So that's if you go up Gear Canyon and head west into the heart of um, where the burn originated. And if you go up to the main trailhead, you might be surprised to find that the bathroom is still fully intact. Um, I don't have a picture of the shelter, but the shelter is fully intact and was not touched even though fire went on three sides of it. Um, this is significant damage here. This is one of the two bridges um, that cross the little creek on the east side of the main trailhead and access some of the trails there. Um, so obviously fire hit that, didn't destroy it, but the other bridge is, was completely consumed almost, there's just the bare bones um, that are left. And so from what I can see at Heil Valley Ranch, these two bridges are the most significant losses in infrastructure. And I considered us to be incredibly fortunate and this to be incredibly minor relative to what um, we could have lost, particularly in things that are not um, replaceable like the caboose, like the historic barn, like the gear cabin. Um, and then there's plenty of minor damage um, where these ties that help um, delineate the, the gravel and the picnic table are just being eaten away slowly by kind of a smoldering um, fire. And so you can just sort of see the, the metal joinery um, sticking out in places. So that's, that's what I wanted to mention to you about the infrastructure at Heil and that we feel fortunate that at least for um, our park, um, the losses could have been a lot worse, uh, not, to, not, not the least of which to speak about visitors and nearby residents and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I, before I um, ask Stefan to talk to you more about the impacts on the forest, I also wanted to kind of do a shout out. Um, the Boulder County Fairgrounds, as some of you may or may not know, act as um, an evacuation center and emergency emergency collection point for livestock in the county. 
And within the space of probably eight or nine hours, it was full uh, of horses in particular, as well as other things. And additional horses were being diverted to the Jefferson County Fairground. So when the evacuation order went out, a lot of people um, pulled together their livestock and brought them to the fairgrounds, which is what it's there for. And we have a great team of staff and volunteers who unfortunately or fortunately are well-versed in dealing with these sorts of emergencies and were able to um, uh, stash a lot of horses, close to 500, um, for at least 24 hours until things could settle down and people who whose properties were um, on Sunday determined no longer to be in danger could come and collect their animals. And the numbers dropped fairly rapidly over the next couple of days. I think on Monday or Tuesday, we were down to just 77 horses, but all of our horse stalls were full. Um, we had goats, uh, we had, I think two chickens, uh, we had two yaks, we had a llama, we had a bunch of random things. Um, these goats were actually having a great time. It didn't seem like it mattered to them that they were in a new home for a couple of days. Um, we had a whole uh, group of shires and this one llama um, who I guess they all like to hang out together. Um, so the place was full um, and I just want to credit our staff and the volunteers for doing a great job of putting a lot of livestock owners um, hearts and minds at ease by having a safe place to take them with, with supplies and bedding and all that kind of stuff. So I think that's, yep, that's it for, for my brief presentation. What I'd like to do is ask um, Stefan if he would um, come online and put up his slides of the forest so you can get a better appreciation of what the burn impact looks like um, at Heil Valley Ranch and in the area. So Stefan. Great, um, can you guys uh, see my screen here? Yep. Yes. Great. So my name is uh, Stefan Reinold. I'm the uh, Senior Forestry Resource Specialist. Um, and as Eric uh, mentioned, he wanted me to talk to you a little bit about the vegetation and what occurred uh, and what, what we have seen just at, on an initial basis. Obviously, things will change over the next uh, few weeks and years. And so I'm not quite, I can't give you an exact answer. Um, but if you look at this map, um, and I'm going to put my cursor out here. So these, the, the areas that I put on this map are areas where we as open space have done forest treatments. So we've done thinning work. Um, a good portion of it, so this whole section right here in the middle, um, we have done prescribed fire on. Uh, we've done prescribed fire back in some of the meadows back here um, by, um, by uh, the caretaker's house. Um, the other location, so this one up here, we've just done a thinning project. And most recently, um, this yellow area um, was where we just did that helicopter uh, thinning project. Um, so I just wanted you to see this in, in context of, of the park itself. Um, and right now, uh, where the line is, um, it kind of comes through here, uh, the top, uh, the, the fire line, I should say, comes through the top right here. Um, and so I just wanted you to see that as well. So now I'm gonna, I have, to, I have to switch the screen one more time. So just hold on a second here um, because I have it in a different folder. And that would be this one. And share. Okay, so first off, um, this was an unbelievably fast moving fire. Um, sustained winds of 40 miles an hour and um, I, I don't even know what the gusts were because I haven't had a chance to go back and, and find out everything, but it was moving very, very quickly. And when that happens, um, unfortunately, even the best projects in the world are not gonna be able to stop something like that. As we saw today, um, a fire was able to blow across the divide. So if that's not the best fuel break in the world, I, I don't know what is. Um, so, um, there's a lot of damage. Um, these, these forests aren't designed for these high intensity fires, especially on a landscape scale. Hitting little pockets here and there, you're, you're gonna get some intense fire on, an, on, on even a low intensity wildfire, and that's okay. But when you get it on the landscape scale, it's, it, it can be pretty devastating. But um, when we went back in, we, we see some green trees, and, and that's obviously 
a good sign. A lot of these areas where we see survival are the areas that we treated, um, areas that we had removed fuel, areas that we had done prescribed fire and, and gotten the ground fuel away. Uh, this particular shot is actually in near drainage. So of course it's gonna be a little wetter. Um, and this is down below the, uh, this is the, uh, the cliff of, of above the Lycanloop parking lot. So this is the drainage uh, down below. Uh, so this just saw some thinning down at the lower section here. Um, you know, just, just another perspective there. Um, but then there's some areas that were hit really hard. And, and, and this was an area that was also treated. So, so just because we treated an area doesn't mean that's guaranteed that there's gonna be some survival. Uh, that tree did finally fall, by the way. Um, but again, you, you look at these different areas where we did, this was an area that we did prescribe fire in. And so how, how come these areas survived? And again, I, I, I will bet that it has a lot to do with the fuel um, that was there on the ground. We're gonna have researchers here um, wanting to study our, our treatments and what occurred uh, for the next five, six years, I would guess. Um, another good shot here. Um, one of the things that low intensity fire typically does is it burns the lower branches off a tree and then kind of hardens the bark a little bit so that if another fire comes, it's even stronger and, and able to withstand fire. So it's kind of a self pruning method. Um, and we see that with our prescribed fires happen all the time where some of the lower branches get burned off. Um, so I'm showing you some of the good stuff, but there's gonna be a few shockers. Um, this is okay uh, because this was an open grassland shrubby area. Uh, but this is over by Red Hill looking down towards uh, the, the Picture Rock Trailhead, which would be out over here somewhere, I believe. Uh, and um, the grasslands burned well, just like a prescribed fire would have. So uh, good news. Um, this is looking back the other direction. Again, a shrubby hillside. Um, we actually, there is a fire line that was constructed that kind of comes down this hillside. Um, but fire, we have, we have turkeys right away, back in there, pecking at the insects. Um, pockets of unburned fuel. And again, this is up near our prescribed fire units. Um, turkeys coming to talk to the firefighters. Um, it, was, it was pretty neat to see. Um, again, some more some, some more heat here. You can see the scorch on these trees. Oh, this one almost went all the way up there, but it's still got some green on it. Um, I, I have hopes for this stand here. Um, once again, for this one. But then there's spots like this. Um, and this is back behind uh, Ingersoll Quarry. Um, and it's complete tree loss, complete. There are, there's, there's no, there is no green on any of this. And, and unfortunately, this is what it's like on most of the Western portion of the property, um, especially on the, on the far Western side because no treatment had occurred and uh, it was just hot in those areas. Um, it did uncover, um, well, I mean, we knew this was here, but it uncovered a dry stack wall that um, Carol Beam, our historic preservationist um, is, is very familiar with. And I think she's gonna be able to get out and see some interesting things uh, post fire. Um, again, kind of a, a little bit of a moonscape here. Um, probably some hydrophobic soils. Um, so that, that could be a problem in this area. So we're definitely going to have to do some rehab. Um, a real quick, another infrastructure uh, success story. This is a $17,000 weather station. And um, we, as we were staging to go do initial attack on the fire, uh, all of a sudden we said, uh-oh, we have our weather station up there. Um, well, our weather station is actually queued up to our um, radios. And so we called it and it started broadcasting and telling us what the weather was at that moment. So we knew that it survived. We didn't know if it had any minor damage or anything like that. But um, so it collects data. Um, a lot of times we have it set up so it collects data and goes online. This data here is actually, um, we're gonna have to download it and take a look. And so it might have some interesting temperature spikes and wind speed spikes. So it'll be pretty neat to see uh, what it recorded. But if you look around here, we looks like we got some good survival, but then look, there's a pocket of dead trees. Now, if that occurred on a low intensity wildfire, 
that, that's not a big deal. That's, a, that's something normal. That's what we should see. Um, it's those big, long stretches of tree loss that are, that are disheartening. The deer were right away back in it. Um, not too concerned. This is a quick shot of um, Marietta Canyon down here. And this, this is what disturbs me the most is this, is this is heavy tree loss in a hard drainage. And so, you know, with, with rain events and things like that, we could see some, um, some real uh, bad erosion potential. So something that concerns me. Um, looking across, you can see that whole hillside is just lost. Again, we did get some pockets of what we call refugia um, and survival. And that's, that's going to be a good thing because it's not a complete uh, loss because we still have some seed source there. So these trees will produce cones and they will drop seeds down the hill. Um, another great look at one of our prescribed fire areas. And I think that's where we're gonna have our best survival is at this spot here. Um, this is our most recent treatment. Um, and uh, so it's basically came down from here. We treated all that. Um, the lower areas, it did what it was supposed to do. It got fire back on the ground, but because things were moving so fast, it raced up this hill and up and over the top. And, and so you can see a lot of the trees near the top were lost. Unfortunately, a lot of those trees up there were in the three to 400 year range uh, age-wise. So it's kind of disappointing. We, we lost a lot of that. Um, we had our big log deck from all the work that we had done. Um, and that was going to heat our facilities, uh, open space facilities in the jail for a couple of years. And uh, that is gone. That burned like a house, unfortunately. Um, this is looking back uh, towards uh, the Lichen Gulch uh, quarry. Um, and we backburned this. So uh, it did act more like a prescribed fire. Um, and we backburned it to keep it from coming across 36. Um, this was a flat area near the top, which I was surprised that it burned so hot and, and, and killed all the trees here. Um, I wanted to show this picture quickly. Um, uh, Eric had showed it before, but one thing that concerns me is uh, the shade of the green on these trees. Um, even though they look like they have needles and look like they're, uh, they survived, they will most likely die in the next couple years. Um, it, it's just too significant of, of a loss. Um, what, you, what you're gonna look for is on this next photo, you can see more green in the top of this tree. And that's, that's gonna be the sign that has a better chance of survival. But look how faded these needles are down here. They all got singed. So my guess is we are gonna lose a lot more trees around the parking lot. And so we're gonna have to, there, there are a lot of papers on how to do assessments for if a tree will survive or not. And we're gonna have to really start doing that research and, and determining what we're gonna find. Um, some, some, again, this is from the Lichen Loop Trail where it starts to meet the Wapiti Trail, looking back. And again, just some significant loss to the western side of the park. Um, just another picture there. Um, and I, I showed this one just as an example of when trees have branches that go down to the ground. Um, fire uses it as a ladder to get to the top of the canopy because this was in an open area, but still uh, was, was torched. Um, again, that flat area, um, it was at the top of that Marietta Canyon that I had showed you. And it, so it raced up the hill and all that heat just blew through. And I'm almost done here. A um, couple pockets you can see of some good survival, but you know, you see these big blown out sections. This section doesn't bother me as much because there is some survival and some pockets and some openings. And so these are good things um, and not, not terrible on the landscape. Again, another prescribed fire area. Um, this is a, uh, a lightning scar that the fire went up, uh, but when I was there, it was completely out. So this is what kind of makes what we call our legacy trees. Like I said before, it kind of hardens that bark and makes it able to survive future wildfires. Um, and so um, I'm hoping that this will be one of our future legacy trees. Um, and, and you may have heard the term old growth. Old growth is really a term based on a forest, not based on an individual tree. Um, so that's, that's why we use the term legacy tree. It's something that has old growth potential in a forest structure. And then we had a couple good old growth trees that did survive, old growth legacy trees. 
So, uh, but look at all the scarring from the fire there. This this guy, no problems. Um, and then the final slide here was just uh, the other day when I was driving out. We saw the we saw yep. this. I saw this white smoke and saw this shoot up. And uh, then all of a sudden we saw the big uh, fire from the um, troublesome East Troublesome come across. So I thought it was our fire blowing up, and I'm thankful that it wasn't. <laughs>